Hey there, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Today on Behind the Charts, we're going to feature a conversation I had not too long ago with two gentlemen from Elliott Wave International. We had Steve Hochberg and Peter Kendall. Steve and Pete, we actually talked about uh, the Elliott Wave process, and the Elliott Wave is not something that's normally part of my investment process, but I had to learn it for the CMT exams, and so got fairly familiar with Elliott Wave and the methodology. I've always found with Elliott Wave, whether or not it's an important part of your timing process and whether or not you buy into all the intricacies of wave patterns and how they uh, manifest themselves in stock prices and asset prices, one thing I've always found valuable and I would encourage you to think about is the behavioral aspect to Elliott Wave. It talks about the wave structure of uh, fear and greed and uh, how buyers and sellers take control and how social mood really drives asset prices. And that's a key distinction. We talked a lot, uh, Peter in particular, he really deals with the socionomic side of things. So how the market doesn't drive the mood, the mood, the social mood, the underlying mood to society is what actually drives asset prices. And we didn't just stop there. We actually talked about pandemics. And this was early before the coronavirus really was evolving and expanding in the United States. It was more of an overseas issue at this point. We talked about the history of uh, pandemics, of, of diseases and how they spread and how they relate to social mood and how that relates to asset prices. So it was an incredibly timely discussion that we had. Um, with Steve, it was a lot more about wave structure and how uh, Elliott Wave uh, can be applied to the overall market environment. So for those of you that are not familiar with Elliott Wave, I think you'll find this a very interesting uh, introduction to the discipline. And I think with my conversation, uh, my questions with Pete, it was more about the relationship between social mood and investing and, uh, and the markets themselves. So here is a fantastic conversation, I thought, with uh, Steve Hochberg and Peter Kendall from Elliott Wave International. Hey everyone, uh, Dave Keller from StockCharts.com here in Gainesville, Georgia at Elliott Wave International. Really excited to sit down with two prominent Elliotticians, uh, Steve Hochberg and Pete Kendall, uh, Peter Kendall, forgive me, Peter. Um, good to meet you guys, good to be with you um, and, and super excited to sort of learn about your backgrounds and how you think about the markets. Um, if we could, could we just start, Steve, uh, with you and just give a quick uh, rundown. How did you get to this point? Where'd you, where did you uh, come from? Um, much like you, I started out, uh, in music in college right. with a little bit of business on the side, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, decided I wasn't going to make much money, uh, going into the music business. So, uh, gravitated toward, uh, finance and economics, um, went to work for Merrill Lynch for uh, a number of years. Uh, I was a, started out as a retail broker and I was probably the worst retail broker there was in the world. <laughs> I hated asking people for money, but, but while I was there, and this was in the uh, very early 1980s, um, okay. I kept reading a guy named Robert Prechter who was putting out mm -hmm. something called the Elliott Wave Theorist, which really interested me. I wound up getting my master's degree uh, in Boston. And mm -hmm. uh, when I left that program, I came down and uh, Bob was kind enough, kind enough to uh, offer me a job. And I've been working here at Elliott Wave ever since. Interesting. And yeah. Peter, could you give us your quick background? Yeah. Um, similar time frame, early 1980s. I worked in Denver, Colorado at a stock market publication it was called the OTC Stock Journal. <laughs> and um, that was an adventure in and of itself. But while I was there, um, you know, I, I was taking a person's place and I said, well, well, when you want to write an article about the market generally and what, what direction it might take, mm -hmm. who, do you, who do you talk to? They, he gave, they was a couple actually, um, they gave me a, a a recommendation of Weinstein and Prechter, and okay. there was a third party who I can't remember. But so those were kind of locked in as people to, to uh, kind of examine what they were up to and how they came to their conclusions. Right. So that's how I met the Wave Principal and Bob Prechter. So both of you, we've talked just a little bit before we, we started the cameras about just Elliott Wave and, and everything. How would you guys describe for someone who's, I, I can't imagine someone would not be familiar with what it is, but let's assume someone's not heard it. How do you describe it? How do you characterize it? to someone who's less familiar with the Elliott Wave principle? What, what is it? How do you think of it? Uh, well, well, let's go to the beginning. It yeah. was formulated by someone named Ralph Nelson Elliott mm -hmm. uh, back in the uh, early 20s and 30s. And uh, he had come down with an illness back then, and he was on his, uh, you know, on his uh, porch, just kind of thing, figuring out things to do. And he turned his sights to the stock market. And, okay. uh, I, and there's speculation, and I think well-founded, that he probably got hurt in a crash. 
So oh, he's, he's right. got questions like, what, what, just what happened? happened? Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Okay. So he's, he was looking at charts of, of stocks and he was looking at uh, charts of bonds and golds trying to figure out what was going on. His, his background is that of an accountant. You yeah. Know, a very right. rigorous accountant who, you know, dotted all the T's and crossed all the <laughs> eyes. I yeah. know what you Dot, mean. <laughs> the eyes and crossed the T's. There you go. So what he was doing is he's looking at these charts and, and he was seeing the same patterns Okay. In stocks and in gold and in bonds, and he said, "You know, wait a minute. And I'm not, I'm not just looking at a chart of stocks or gold or bonds because the right. same news that affects gold or stocks may not affect bonds in the same way. But these same patterns kept redeveloping, and he was watching them on the chart. And he said, "You know what? What I've discovered is there's some basic element to the natural development of human psychology hmm. that's consistent across markets that people." in groups get more optimistic in a patterned way when the trend is going up right. and they get more pessimistic in a patterned way when the trend is going down. And then he meticulously categorized these patterns right. into what he called waves. Um, and so it's kind of a three step forward, two step back process. And that's kind of how the Elliott wave principle yeah. was formulated. And I think right. he, he was a subscriber to Robert Rayo's Tao theory letter. Yeah. Right. So, okay, sure. so he had an, uh, the idea of an impulse wave that that works in the direction of the main trend that possibly came from down theory but it certainly is a, a big part of the wave principle you know right. when, when you're when you're in a bull market or a bear market you can have what they call the main trend and it will move in five waves right so i'm curious with both of you what drew you to the elliott wave methodology right um because you both mentioned mentors, you both mentioned uh, you know early influences that sort of uh, introduced Elliott Wave to you. But what drew you to the methodology? Because there's a behavioral component, there's a psychological component, there's a sociological component, there's an analytical, you know, quantitative component. What about it resonated with both of you guys? Well, let me start with. Uh, I, I remember the first time that I was uh, exposed to it. Mm -hmm. I was working at Merrill Lynch, okay. and uh, I can't remember what. I mean, it might have been GE. They were coming out with earnings, yeah. and uh, our analysts at the time said, "Well, well GE is going to earn X number of dollars a share." And mm -hmm. and uh, I said, "Okay." And and earnings came out, and they hit it to the penny. It was exactly what the analysts suggested it would be. And the stock just cratered, it tanked. And, I'm like, I'm sorry, and I was trying to figure this out. I'm saying they just hit their earnings. The analysts right. predicted what their earnings would be. Why wouldn't the stock go up? Right. And so that was about the time that I was reading Bob. Mm. And uh, Bob had been doing some uh, forecasting in terms of the market and, and individual issues. And um, you know, following along, it just made perfect sense to me. It clicked with me. Yeah that markets were patterned and I can understand the psychology behind it. And that's mm -hmm. really what drew me to it first. And right. I remember reading his book and, and it just made sense to me. Everything yeah. was like, okay, I understand how the world works now yep. by reading the principle, <laughs> wave principle. So Interesting. You know. What about you, Peter? I would say that I, now I'm re rethinking it a little bit because I didn't think of that before, but um, they have this thing they call market focus. And, uh -huh. and it's uh, basically, I just read that in the headline the other day, market focus shifts to whatever they want it to shift to that that the news cycle and the market cycle don't match up and <laughs> and so that was that was very influential for me as well hmm. and there's just, you know countless examples of that every day yeah um so there was that there was also a textbook you know it wasn't hmm. a black box so you could just oh i get the book i can operate this thing right i can see how how it's supposed to operate and there the, the rules and guidelines were there yeah. and they're you know pretty specific you know you, there's things that you can't do based on the wave principle. So that's right. It, it, it structures the world in a very interesting way. So Steve, you mentioned, um, you know, GE, I think, reporting earnings and, right. and what the stock did relative to that. We're, you know, in the middle of earnings season right now. And one of the uh, maybe critiques or challenges to, you know, broader technical analysis is how helpful can it be during earnings season, right? Because earnings come out and that does it. What do you, how do you approach it? How would you answer that? What, what's the benefit or what's the purpose of using charts at during earnings season on a stock that's reporting earnings is it worth was it worth doing or oh, ab abs in fact i would take the opposite tack okay. right? and i would say ignore the earnings and just look at the <laughs> chart uh because how many times we've we seen earnings come out and the, and you think they're great earnings and the stock goes down or you think they're horrible earnings and all of a sudden yeah. the stock goes up yeah. um, and i think all good forecasting and that's what we're trying to do in this business is kind of look around the next corner yeah requires technical analysis. It requires mm -hmm. it because you 
you, if you use fundamental analysis, you have to predict your indicators. For example, mm -hmm. let's believe that you think that the Fed is going to lower interest rates and that's going to be good for the stock market. Well, number one, you have to predict the Fed, what they're going to do. Are they going to lower interest rates? Yes or no. And number two, you have to predict what a particular market might do in response to that. So there's a whole chain of causality that can break down. To us, it's much easier just saying the trend in stocks is up and that <laughs> trend is going to continue until it, until it changes. And right. so we look at each component individually. Yep, yep, yep. Um, okay. And you're going to get positive effects based on the upward trend. It's not the other way around. The, right. The, the negative facts, the negative things happen and the market goes down. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pull in the cart. It's sure. not the market is. That's right. No, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that there was a secondary thing that happened mm -hmm. for me, and that was in 1985, Bob pub published a report. It was August of 1985. It was called Stock Market and uh, the Popular Culture in the Stock Market. Okay. And he basically had been, it kind of had been building up. It went back to Elliot. Elliot said, what's implied here, I'm, I'm calling this a natural law. Therefore, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's got a depth of involvement in society yeah. and it's going to affect electricity, electricity usage. And uh, Elliot cited a few things, but he didn't go real far down that road. Now, Bob was kind of exploding the concept and um, that was the beginning. That was the first step, but it drew me in because it said, this is a technical tool that has application in, 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 in warfare, in politics, in, in, in why, um, it, it could answer a lot of questions that right. a, a, a moving average couldn't. So that's why I was drawn to it further. Hmm. Now, down through the years, of course, it, it's, it's become an academic area. It's called socionomics. And, hmm. and uh, as a firm, we pursue that. And it takes us down some very interesting roads. You know, yeah. so when I read Bob's, I, I'm assuming his first book on, on socionomics, on that sort of term, when I was introduced to that. I remember reading it. And what struck me about it was that the the idea of causality right so a lot of people think the market's doing well so people are excited and 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 i'm simplifying i'm sure you could probably correct me but he was sort of spinning you know reversing that basically saying the yeah. social mood yes. is what drives stock yeah, exactly. prices right how i mean how could you describe socionomics a little further because i the the concept of it makes it really resonated to me in terms of thinking about you know social mood as a as a quantitative thing yeah, it's really just an, an academic uh, approach to what uh, he witnessed or what we've witnessed in the, in the stock market over the course of the years. Socionomics is the study of uh, uh, social psychology mm -hmm. as it marches through time in bull and bear phases. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the coronavirus is, is a good example. Right now, it's a big news story. It's cited as the cause for weakness in the market. But we would say, no, that's not what's happening. It's not causing the market to do anything. The, the social mood in China turned in 2007. It's been down. Mm. It's down 50 percent. And, and, and as the, measured by the Shanghai composite, as which is the Shanghai. best measure of mood there is. That's right. In terms actually, of, actually, we have to double check that. It's, it was down 55 yesterday. Today, I don't know. But <laughs> it's, it's a fast moving market. And it's all I think it's actually up today. So it's probably 52 percent. So so people are going to say, oh, Corona is. Is, is, is not as big a problem as it was yesterday. We say, no, it's a, it's a longstanding problem. Disease is a result of a bear market. It happens, we, we've uh, documented that extensively in, 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 in full issues of what we call the Socionomous. It's a monthly publication that came out in 2009, near the low, talking about um, the, the diseases, the SARS that was created in 2002, and then there were other diseases in 2008 and nine when there was a bear market and uh, as a result of a bear market, social mood. Interesting, interesting. So yeah, yeah. what it really boils down to is, is psychology, is mass yeah. psychology, and how, right. how groups of people behave when they get together. We all have individual free will. We all can understand what's right and wrong, but for some reason, when we get in a group and a crowd, it takes on a <laughs> dynamic of its own. And that's really what we're studying here is that group dynamic and how sure. it moves in a patterned way from pessimism to optimism, and some of the ancillary effects that are, that 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 come from that. For example, is is his mood is 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 turning more positive. The the mm. posi po positivity is dominant over say negative mood. You know, you start getting happy pop songs on 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 TV. You 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 get upbeat uh, uh, upbeat uh, movies. You mm. might uh, Disney movies might do well. Uh, you know, skirt lengths come up. We all know about right. the hemline indicator. Hemline indicator so, sure. so there's all sort of ancillary indicators that come hmm. out of a positive mood, just as there are with a negative mood. Right. And that's really what 
juices us up is, is kind of exploring that and trying to figure out where we are within the progression of that. And maybe, yeah. and what we do in the newsletters, we talk about that a lot, about what we're seeing in culture and some of the implications it might have for, for broader society, but also for the market. And, yes. and because they're all emanating from the same spot, you yes. know, the same wellspring of mood. So one of the questions, you know, th that I think a lot of investors are struggling with now is that it's certainly the market has felt euphoric for the last couple of years, right? Where, you know, depending on where you start the clock, we might be 10 plus years into a cyclical bull market or, or certainly, you know, pretty, pretty extended in it. And so I, I think a lot of people are questioning, you know, you know, markets tend to end in euphoria, bull market. So how do you determine how euphoric can you get, right? How is there a way that you would categorize where we're at right now uh, from a psychological, from a sociological perspective? Are you seeing signs that tell you, yes, euphoria has happened, or is it still no slow and steady? We've got plenty of upside from a, you know, from that perspective. Well, there's there's two ways to do it, okay. and and from my perspective, what I work at is the actual wave structure because okay. there's rules and guidelines within the Elliott Wave principle that mm -hmm. deal with where you are within the progression of that specific structure. And when that pattern is over, it's over, okay. you know, the, the trend reverses. So it, uh, in our estimation, what we're dealing with right now is, is a, what's called a fifth wave rally. Hmm. Uh, rallies and declines, depending upon where we are, uh, move in, in a pattern of five waves. Hmm. So you have, an, so for example, in a bull market, you have an initial rally from a bottom, which is wave one, and then you'll have a pullback, which is wave two, but, but that pullback doesn't go to a new low. It holds above the previous low. Right. And then you'll have a third wave, which is the third wave, which is the longest and strongest extended wave. And then you'll have a fourth wave correction, maybe a sideways move, and then a final fifth wave rally. Mm -hmm. So in our estimation, we're in a fifth wave of this bull market Got it. Uh, that we can trace back. And that's really where we look for the signs of euphoria or mm -hmm. bullishness or optimism. And we can measure that in a lot of different ways through basic indicators like put call ratios or sure. sentiment surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's other cultural aspects too that, that we deal with when we, uh, when we look at that. So. Right, um, let's see, culturally, uh, what happens at the end of a fifth wave? Um, but yeah. what, what happens, is basically what's been going on for 20 years. I mean, it started in, <laughs> it started in 2000, yeah. and um, you had a euphoria there. You had another somewhat more muted euphoria in 2007, and we and we have one now. Right. So we've this is uh, what we would call a fifth wave of very high degree. So what that means is there's waves within waves, and uh, this one actually, this bull market actually dates back to the late 1700s. So this fifth wave is 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 one that um, nobody will ever relive because yeah. it will you know it, it won't happen again for a long time. But right. um, so what you have is kind of uh, peaks on your peaks right now. Uh, Two thousand. We, we'll show a chart in the latest issue that shows the percentage of companies not earning money that are in the in the, uh, in the that are listed on stock exchange, and it's That's amazingly an it pops really hard in two thousand or nineteen ninety nine. Uh -huh. And it really doesn't go down. I mean, in the in the bear market phases, it it goes to twenty percent. Okay. And now it's it, and recently it hit a record of twenty nine. That was last year. Right. But um, twenty nine percent of the firms that are listed have not made money for three years, and it's a remarkable achievement if you think about it. And it's, we were fortunate to 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 have lived through this period. <laughs> yeah. So is that higher than it was in the late nineties, early two thousand? Yes. Yeah. No yeah. I'm kidding. Right. Yeah. Right. So wow. the fact that people want to buy these companies. <laughs> Yeah. Now I'm not consistent right. as far as I can it, tell. It shows you how important psychology is. Right. In, That's in, right. A, in an hard. earlier time, which we think matters, we think that earlier time is is the baseline, and right. that's what we return to, not to the not to 2000 at this point. We sure, at least on that chart. Right. 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 Yeah. right. So that that's another great way of measuring the euphoria. I mean, the fact right. that there is a lot of people that want to buy companies that don't make any money tells you that we're in this kind of latter stage, this fifth wave of the advance right. that we've been tracking. So if we could pivot a little bit. So um, if you think of the fixed income markets, you have this rare, um, maybe not so rare situation, but the situation where stocks have felt very elevated, bonds continue to break to new highs. So how, how what would be your perspective on stocks versus bonds, where people are getting nervous about the extended nature of stocks? Are bonds setting up in an attractive way of some sort? Or how would you think about 
that asset allocation exercise between stocks and bonds at this point. One of the, because I get this question a lot, and yeah. one of the key points that that I'd like to make is that uh, there's no consistent correlation that holds over time between any two asset classes. Mm. So a lot of people will say, you know, well, if stocks are going to go down, maybe I should buy bonds or gold because they'll go up. Safe haven. Yeah, they're a safe yeah. haven. Yep. But but if you simply look at a chart of the two, there are periods yeah. when they do trend together and there's periods when they trend apart uh, and there's periods where there's literally no correlation between yeah. the two at all. So it's very difficult trying to forecast one with the other, trying to say yeah. you should go into bonds as, as a safety measure. Now, bonds have been in a bull market for what, 33 years, 34 uh -huh. years? And we think that bull market is, is coming to an end. Uh -huh. um, and one of the periods that we've studied as a kind of a corollary to the current period is the 1930s, because I think okay. the next event that's gonna occur is deflation not inflation. Mm. I mean, we've been trying to create inflation for how many years with the Fed, but yeah. there's so much debt in society right now that uh, that in a credit-based monetary system like we have, a reduction in that credit is deflation. So I mm. think we might get inflation or hyperinflation down the road, but first we're going to go through a deflationary period. Okay. So what we did was we looked at the last great deflationary period in the United States, was, which is the 30s and, and 40s, and we noticed something about bonds, and that is bond prices went down and yields went up, mm -hmm. um, and which is kind of counterintuitive. Price. But what happened was people, even on the highest grade, you, know, you got an initial spike up in interest rates and a decline in bond prices. Uh, and people got a little bit scared uh, of a return of their money, not so much a return on their money. Mm -hmm. And I think a similar situation is going to happen now with all the debt that we have in society, with interest rates literally at zero. I think at some point, psychology is going to morph to where people are going to get concerned about getting return of their money on time. Mm. Um, and so I could see a, uh, at least a brief spike up in interest rates uh, while stocks go down, which would be a little bit counterintuitive. Right. So um, I, I don't, I mean, if you're going to look at the bond market, you probably should look at short-term bonds sure. okay. where you can get your money out pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. Okay. To give you an idea of how this fits in with what we're doing right now, we're putting together a letter and we're going to talk about stocks and bonds together and the mm -hmm. allocation. Uh, I think it's the American Association of Individual Investors. Okay. They have, they just, they have the typical or the average allocation. And it's, it's interesting that um, it's for stocks and bonds, and it's uh, it spikes to a high of over 70% in 2000. Okay. So we're looking at that and going, oh, that's interesting. And um, and then we also noticed that the actual high, higher than that even, was in 1998. <laughs> so, hmm, so it's like, hmm, a little bit lost momentum. And, and that right. is a, a third wave peak in, in 1998. And then uh... the lower high on the fifth wave is, is it's a still a spike, but it can't quite get to the, the enthusiasm that was generated by the third wave. Right. That's 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 very Elliot. You know, that's that's <laughs> right. Uh, uh, for, for right right out of the book, as I was saying. Right. It's a wonder to behold is what a third wave is. It's got the breadth that you love, and um, it's just a stronger market. Sure. So it ends with these these spikes. So now come forward to the current point in time, and we find that in January 2018, which was another third wave, you had a, a higher high in the in the allocation. Interesting. Of seventy percent. Okay. Um, so lower than than in two thousand. So you have the same divergence on a long term basis, and we think that's important. And we'll show that to say it looks like the party's over. Right. 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 Could we pivot just a bit? I would. I would love to ask about your routines, how you actually go through the process of analyzing charts, because you guys are, <clears throat> I think, between the two of you, covering a lot of different markets, a lot of different asset classes. How do you approach that you know, for a day, for a week? I mean, what's your process of actually digesting all of these charts, all of these, all this stuff, and then coming up with a thesis? Do you have a routine that you could speak to? Uh, probably not a, not a set one. I mean, I come in and I put my screens on and there's a bunch of charts all over the place. And, the cockpit. Yeah, the <laughs> cockpit. And you're, and you're cycling through. We were talking before about having a routine. You do have a bit of a routine, don't you? Every morning do some numbers or something? Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I put in, I look at certain things like uh, indicators and, and so forth. But, but basically, I'm just trying, to, just trying to get a sense of where stocks are. You know what is, is gold moving against it with it you know and i'm so I'm, I'm trying to just get a broad tapestry yeah uh and then and then something will jump out of me as i'm looking through my charts something will be you know you know either a pattern in the in the vix or, or there's something i was see you know put right. call ratios will grab me or something and then 
and that leads to something else and that's kind of how we develop our uh our view yeah it's really it's really driven by the trends like um, sure. I, we've spent a lot of time in the last year on china okay why well it is just interesting and and dynamic and an important market it's the second largest economy in the world sure a lot on the economy in china um and that just happens organically we'll go to where the wave principle directs us i would say got it or, or 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 the economy and deflation that's another theme that we that we hammer okay it, right. i mean it's fascinating to us that you know china topped out in 2007 yeah. still down 50 sure. percent you know and and the u.s is 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 like this you know this is going on. so there's this you know this the second largest economy in the in the world relative to the u.s and there's this huge dichotomy going on and that interests a lot i mean why is there's this this huge dichotomy when yeah. when we're we're so interconnected in many ways That's right. uh but you know something there is different and we've been talking a lot about yeah. that one one of the things that we we follow is is government and its role yep. in the wave principle and basically the government's role in the wave principle is to come in after the trend and try and enforce it after it's complete <laughs> that's that's what the government does. Uh, right. Literally, I mean, so now with the, the look at the the scope of things. Where did the Federal Reserve come in? It came in in a fourth wave uh, in the in the 1914 when the market was down to 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 solve uh, a, 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 really a market problem which was over. I mean, it and yeah. the, the worst of it was over by 2014. It did continue on. We had a world war, but by then there was there was a, there was 1914 was really uh, a, a big bottom year, and that's when the Fed comes in. So now, this, fast forward to the end of a bull market, and governments around the world are trying ways to keep the bull market alive mm -hmm. after it's it's um, it's basically complete in some places and completing in others. Right. What uh, just to wrap up? What if someone is just getting started, unfamiliar with the Elliott Wave principle or how you guys approach things? What would you direct them to? How how should they? What would you tell a younger you trying to learn this uh, this craft, this toolkit? Well, first thing is come to our website, which okay. is www.elliotwave.com. Two okay. L's, two T's, one word. Elliott Wave, because there's a ton of free material, including uh, how to use the wave principle. What is the wave principle? How to use it? You know how to apply it, um, the basic tenets of it. It's it might be daunting at first, but really once you read through it a couple of times, you're like, okay, and you start labeling a chart or you start looking at a chart, going, okay, I see a five wave move there. It's amazing how quickly you pick it up. So if you're interested in the wave principle at all, and I think in our estimation, it's the best best methodology on how to organize kind of what's going on in the market that's where i would start is come to the website read our material you know read up on the wave principle and then uh and then try to apply it you know just pull, pull, pull up a chart uh stock charts and uh you know you just look at something and say okay do i recognize a pattern there yeah. and if you do then label it and you know and, and try to make a forecast of it and then you know see how it comes out from there yeah, like the, the, the text, which Steve refers to a lot, and he says, see text page. So that text is Elliott Wave Principle by Robert Prechter and A.J. Frost. Got it. So that's a very helpful. Classic uh, book. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. And it explains it all. And uh, it really, you can pick it up pretty quickly. I was you. You've brought back somewhat good, but somewhat bad memories of studying for the CMT exams <laughs> and going through. And I'll never forget sitting with a colleague trying to lay out waves and, uh, and manage it. But, the, but I'd say that's how you learned it though. Right. That's, at least that's how I did. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's it, you just do it. You just do it and you make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes and then pretty soon you're applying it and you're going, okay, and, and, and hopefully making some money from it. Yeah, 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 that's great. Steve and Peter, thank you guys so much. This is really, really interesting. For appreciate, it. appreciate it. it. Yeah, 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 it's a pleasure. Everyone, this is uh, Steve Hotchberg and uh, Peter Kendall from Elliott Wave International. Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.